Welcome, welcome, welcome to the U I experience. To the U, to the U I, the U I, the U I. Welcome to the U I experience. Experience. Good afternoon, those out in U I Radio Land. UI Nation and every other part of the United States and all over the world that happens to tune in to listen to our show. I appreciate all of you and how you support this show. My name is Jalal Tariq, and this is the 31st edition of the UI Daily Show, otherwise known as Real Talk with Jalal Tariq. I'm going to stop numbering them, too. Because it's going to get really stupid when I get up to around 450, 457. So it's just 457. But in any event, um, I want to welcome you all to my show. And I appreciate you coming in to listen to us, try and move ourselves forward as a people. And um, I hope that in the future, people will join us in the chat room and people will give their feedback on what we're talking about. Tell us we don't know what we're talking about. Give us kudos, thumbs up, whatever the case may be, whatever you feel comfortable with. Um, And moving straight into our first topic, um, UI Jane is here. And for those of you who don't know, everybody should know, but those of you who don't know, today is the Urban Intellectuals Membership Drive. And UI Jane has a few things that she wants to share with us concerning that fact. Good morning. Good, good afternoon, everyone. Um, first of all, I would like to thank everyone that has joined the membership so far. You are greatly appreciated, and we're definitely moving forward. But with that being said, for the life of me, I can't understand why people come to Facebook or Google or Instagram or whatever social media outlet they are in just to them. You complain about the white man this. You complain about how the black community don't, doesn't have that. But yet and still, you don't want to do anything about it. We're not asking you to get on the ground and do anything. All we're asking of you is to donate $2 a month, which is $24 a year. We're not asking for blood. We're not asking you to put your house up for um, a second mortgage. We're just asking you to help us better the black community. I can only see one reason why or two reasons why you don't want to donate. A, you won't have anything else to complain about once everything gets um, on the ground, or B, you're afraid. You're absolutely terrified of change. But at this point, they're gunning us down. They're turning our water off. They're turning our electricity off. What more can you ask for? What more must they do to you to make you see that there's a change that needs to come? There's no excuse for the black community to be in a state that it's in. We have, I mean, we could give uh, 101 excuses. I'm going to give you that. But at the end of the day, it all boils down to what we want, if we really want the change. We can't continue on to they're saying such and such is holding us back and they won't let us do this and they won't let us do that. Well, we have to first try. If you try or if we try and they stop us, that's one thing. But we're not even trying. Some of us aren't. I can name a million and one things that a black person spends $24 in in a week supporting white supremacy. What we don't realize is a lot of the same people in this country own the same things. The same white supremacy that's controlling you are the same white supremacy that you're giving your money to. The same you complain about what you watch on TV, but yet still you pay money to the people that donate to the or to that airs their commercial during the time that your your shows are coming on. You don't like the way black women are portrayed on love and hip-hop, but then when you love and hip-hop, there's a Walmart commercial being aired. There's a McDonald's commercial being aired. There's a Popeye's Church's KFC commercial being aired. You're contributing to those things when you support and buy and shop at those places. So you're paying to see yourself being dolled out. You don't like how everybody on the first 48 hours suspects are black, but yet still you allow them into your community. 
And again, you support the people that air commercials during those times that sponsor these shows. And so in actuality, you sponsor these shows. Quit complaining and do something. And even if you don't want to be a part of urban intellectuals, that's fine. But stop complaining and do something. That's all. Hear, hear. I agree 100%. That is absolutely the truth. Back a couple of months ago, when I first started um, the Boycott Facebook personal movement, when I started doing UI Tuesdays, and last week, a couple of weeks ago maybe, um, around my birthday, I took a whole week off of Facebook. I didn't respond to anything. I'd pop over there and read what was there. But I spent all of my time on the UI Nation website because I'm I'm getting to that point now where I really, really, really want to deactivate my Facebook account. And but I want to ease into it because I don't want people to think that I just disappeared, you know. And it is good in the sense that it reaches a lot of people that might not be on UI and it reaches a lot of people that I might be trying to basically pull to our page. However, I agree with you. It, we are absolutely hooked on forms of communication and avenues and outlets that basically make people rich other than us. And I think it's because a lot of people, and I'm going to try and be quick with this so we can move on to something else, and plus I can get everybody's um, uh, take on this, but I don't think that people really realize what the true purpose of social media is. People think that social media, um, things like Facebook, things like Instagram, things like Twitter, Reddit, Pinterest and all of the rest of them that's out there, people have a tendency of thinking that those things exist for us to communicate with each other. No, those things exist for them to sell you stuff. Simple as that. They are multi-billion dollar companies who are every day they're um, joining together. One is by Facebook bought Instagram when Instagram became a, a threat, and they'll go out and they'll all come together to you from your hard-earned dollars. That's what it's for. They do experiments on you in the background. They, you ever wonder why you will go on an Amazon or eBay or you go on Google and you might price a pair of shoes, you might price a tablet, a phone, you might buy something on one of these uh, online shopping sites, and all of a sudden similar ads for similar things just show up on your, on your feed. And you're like, hmm, I wonder how did they know that I – because all that's joined together. So – the advantage of being a member of Urban Intellectuals, on the other hand, is we don't have ad dollars like that. We don't have ads just flowing across our, fa our page. Our page exists for one thing and one thing only, to educate us as a people, period. That's it. That's all. We don't care that you're looking for a new Fendi bag. Is Fendi still in? We don't care <laughs> that you're looking where to buy the cheapest iPhone 6. We don't care. All we want you to do is take this information that we're giving to you, marinate on it, and try and use it to change your life. Patrick, I know you got something. Um, I agree that we use social media. Uh-oh. I agree that we use social media incorrectly. Um, I think we should be for all of our for all of our recognition for our, as things being as bad as they are, and for as powerful a tool as social media is. I definitely think we could be doing a lot more with it collectively than we are. Me personally, I use social media as a networking tool. Um, I come in. I have about 10 or 15 chat boxes open. I'm talking to people. I'm in and out of groups. I'm meeting people. I'm organizing. I'm trying to make things happen, and then I go away. 
Um, you know, you'll rarely see me updating personal statuses. You'll rarely see, I mean, because for me anyways, personally, like, you know, I'm sorry, Facebook, but I don't know you like that. Like, and that goes to, you know, the people on my friends list, those that need to know my personal life and whatever, whatever, they have my phone numbers. We can talk. For everybody else, all of the other thousands of people that are just subscribers, they subscribe into um see me promote other people or see me maybe talking about black issues or things like that. I just think we've become way too um we've become way too apathetic to the possibilities and what's actually happening behind the scenes when it comes to social media. We just kind of do stuff and put it out there and put it up there and not really concern ourselves with it. Um, and in the black community, we could be doing a tremendous amount of good rebranding our own image through social media if we were to work it that way, organizing instantaneously developed national organizations, international global organizations within a matter of, you know, weeks to months if we actually were using it to its fullest capabilities. We could be doing some tremendous things through social media if we actually utilized it in a means that was productive for us. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, TB, thoughts, my friend? I think if people can go on websites and they can be a part of groups that their focus is like just posting ratchet videos, and, and they love that. It's like... 300 people in this group and their whole all they do is just post these videos of people fighting and acting a fool okay if you can take the time to be a part of that group then i'm just wondering to myself well why couldn't you take the time to be a part of a group that's about trying to move people forward and if you think about 24 dollars again we're looking at that money can be spent so quick you don't even realize you spent 24 i do that on the regular, I go out, make a couple purchases. I'm like, well, I only got four items in my basket. It's twenty five dollars, you know. So you can, you can, you can definitely spend the money. Um, this comes down to consciousness of that individual person or persons. You know what? What do you, what do you want to stand for in this lifetime? What do you want to represent in this lifetime? Do you want to just drift through this life? with no purpose, just kind of living day to day, taking whatever comes, or would you like to leave some kind of personal legacy that you tried to make a difference in some area of your life? And so that's what the membership is about. It's about saying, look, if you have opinions and you're always commenting on how things are not right with African-American people, then this is an opportunity for you to become a part of someone in something that can make the situation different, that can make the situation better. And I said this really about maybe three or four shows ago that one of the problems is that it's hard to get black folks to go in their own bank accounts or their own pockets and pull out some money and give it to other black folks. Uh, we're, we're so quick to run and get that money to, you know, Caucasian businesses, but we just somehow question when it's us and we're saying we could use your $24 to move forward, then people want to question, well, what are you going to do with the $24? Again, I just think if you're going to ask us that, you know, when you go into these Caucasian businesses, perhaps you should do the same thing with them. You know, when you give them your money, say, hey, what are you going to do with this money? And they may tell you, we're going to feed our families with it. We're going to move our families forward with it. We're going to pay income taxes and, and create a strong tax base in our communities with it. That's what we're going to do with your money. Are we going to put any of it back in your community? No, we're not. So this becomes a consciousness that people have to think about. Just be conscious of what it is that we're asking you to do, not forcing you. We all have choices, but just be balanced in what it is that you choose to participate in. It's okay if you, if you like the kind of person that, you know, you like fighting and, and, and all that kind of strife and turmoil and somehow that, that, that turns a part of your soul on, okay, that's, that's, that's your right. But I'm just hoping there's a counterbalance and that another part of your soul says, hey, you know what, let, let, me, let me try to just be conscious and be a part of this movement. So I just think that's what people should at least take into consideration and just go ahead and become a part of, of UI in that sense and become a member. Okay. And getting back to the whole separating ourselves and our finances from those who basically are not going to do anything for us with the money that we donate to their cause, um, that's always going to be a big part of everything that I do. 
is if I give some money to something or if I actively support something, where does it move my people? And <clears throat> don't get me wrong. Don't get me wrong. Zuck, when you thought about how to, you know, make this platform call Facebook, I was all with you because you came up with a better idea. You came up with, you know, what was the dude's name from MySpace, Tom? You took Tom's idea. What have happened to Tom? I wonder if he's a member of Facebook. Anyway, you took Tom's idea and you raised it to the next level. And now someone behind Jeffrey Zuckerberg is going to take his idea and raise it to the next level. There's another site out there that's coming up now that is invitation only that might be a threat to Facebook. But my point is this. It's a means of communication. It's, to me, I liken it to a microphone. And you can take this microphone. This microphone for Facebook right now is loud. It's extremely loud. It's loud to the point that it reaches every corner of this planet. There's people in Tibet up in the mountains that's got Facebook accounts. So it's loud. UI, on the other hand, has a smaller microphone. But that smaller microphone is more effective in the sense that we are actually talking about something. I mean, if you really think about it, how you approach social media, do you read each and every last post that's in your timeline? Of course you don't. There's only so many hours in a day and you have more important things to do. You catch up on birthdays. You catch up on anniversaries. You catch up on this. You catch up on that. But for the most part, 90% of the stuff that passes through your eyeballs goes out the back of your head because it does not interest you. We like to think at UI Nation that everything that we put on our page is going to be something that is going to directly affect you. It might not individually say, okay, well, I'm laying in the bed and now this particular subject is in my bedroom with me. No, that's not what I mean. What I mean is, is that if we promote a cause that moves forward and moves all of us forward, then you get to be a part of that whether or not you're actually contributing or not. So why would you not want to actually try and join that and try and push that ahead? And with that, we're going to jump off of that. Um, better yet, better yet, no, I'll take that back. I have one last question for you, UI Jane. Can you explain a little bit of what are some of the benefits besides the personal ones of the pride that you feel with uh, supporting something of your own, what are some of the other benefits that you get from joining UI? Well, some of the benefits um, include we're going to link you to black-owned businesses, and with that you get a discount with by shopping and using these black-owned businesses. Uh, the main goal for us is to promote black-owned businesses so that our money, black dollars, could circulate back through the black community the way that most other communities do, the Jewish, the Hispanics, the Italians, all their dollars flow multiple times within their communities. So we're trying to promote blacks supporting blacks. The next thing is supports the um, activist side where we're trying to go into the communities and go door to door if we have to and educate on um, politics, economics, and the importance of education to build and strengthen up the black community. So those are um, some of the things that are some of the benefits that's coming with the membership. I thank you for that information. Okay. Before we get to our second topic, I want to kind of alert everyone to what's coming up on Real Talk. In the very near future, I am reaching out to our partners in the uh, UI News Team 1. And what I want to try and do is I want to try and bring more of a focus on current affairs and things that affect us in a, in a general sense or in a personal sense. And for those who are not following 
urban intellectuals from the news standpoint. Um, we give our own specific brand of commentary on a lot of the the issues that might be affecting us, a lot of the things that are happening in the news cycle. Because if you could turn on the TV and you can listen to the talking heads on CNN, on Fox News, if that's your thing, <coughs> what I call Comedy Central, if you can go on one of those uh, channels and listen to what they have to say, which is basically them just reporting what happened and telling what they think about it because they weren't there. We can do the same thing. And I want to start bringing and incorporating that particular group into our show. I'm already talking to one of the coordinators right now about how we can possibly make this happen, but that's something that's coming up, um, which leads into a good segue into topic number two. I don't know how many people have read about it, and I'm quite sure that we have all, I'm fairly certain that most of us have heard that the Ebola has actually made it to the United States other than bringing some white person home to actually cure them of an incurable disease, but that's a whole other story. Um, Liberian man traveled to, oh, I don't want to say he's Liberian, traveled to Liberia, came back, landed in Dallas. 26, he started feeling ill, went to the hospital. No one seems to know right now whether or not somebody actually asked him whether he had traveled to one of the hot zones, what they call the hot zones in Africa, and they basically gave him some antibiotics, which leads me to believe that he's probably one of us. <laughs> they gave him some antibiotics and some Motrin, and they sent him on his way. Two days later, he came back, symptoms a little bit worse. Now somebody starts to recognize, hey, this dude might be really, really sick, and they admitted him to the hospital, and now he's in serious condition, and he's being treated for the Ebola virus. Is this a threat to us? Is this a major threat to us? Do we think that Ebola is something that can get out of hand in a developed country like the United States? And I ask this for that reason. I actually was, I've been screaming about Ebola for, what, two months? I was screaming about Ebola when people weren't even really recognizing the fact that only 100 people had died in West Africa. I stopped posting articles about that and said, watch this, watch this, watch this. And I hate to be right, and I'm not patting myself on the back because I'm right, but I've always said that nine times out of ten, if you're coming from that uh, continent, you're nine times out of ten going to be African. And nine times out of ten, the people that you come over here and have contact with is going to be African American. So, Terry, you up first. All right. Uh, well, I think there's five questions that I just kind of asked myself. And that's, is, you know, what are the chances it'll spread? Is there a vaccine? that I can take in case it does spread, you know, the people who were on the plane with the guy, that's critically important because the plane could have had, you know, 230 people on it. So should those people at the airport who were on the same plane be concerned? The other thing is how well are the hospitals here in the United States prepared if we have that kind of an outbreak and what can we do to actually stop the potential spread? So those are the questions that I'm asking myself. But when I think about the question you pose i actually think just right now it's 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 not a serious risk because there's one person and then there's someone that's very close to that person who they're monitoring not they didn't say that person has the virus but they're monitoring that person the other thing i'm looking at is how you actually spread the disease itself and and just thank goodness that it's not an airborne virus it can't be spread by just standing next to the person and breathing in the same air that they're breathing you know it has to be transmitted through bodily fluids so uh, i'm concerned but just right now i'm not overly concerned i think that because you have this one person who does have it it's easy to jump on top of that right now but the key is going to be if somebody else does have it how quickly can you get to the other people that that person has been around because that's how you're going to wind up losing control of it. So that's what's going to be real important. Well, I 
actually read an article. I don't know if this is the same second person that everyone is talking about, but I read an article on CNN where they were saying that the, the first victim actually had contact with school children in Texas. And I want to say that came from actually the governor. I want to say that came from Rick Perry. And he said uh, that the person had had contact with school children. I'm of the mind this, you know, I'm a fairly big conspiracy theory type person. I don't believe you when you tell me that it's not airborne, you know, because I'm looking at how it's spreading in on the continent. And I'm thinking to myself, you mean to tell me that each one of these 6,000 people over the last, what, four months that it's really been tracking, over the last four months, each one of these 6,000 people actually touched somebody that had this, this virus? Can you get it off of a hard surface? Can you leave it on a pillow? You see what I'm saying? So that's my question and all of it. And I, you know me, I don't trust them when they tell me, oh, you can't get you okay. <laughs> Just like the cure is like only work on white people. Anyway, uh, Patrick, what you think? Well, um, you know, one one of my favorite subjects in the world is is biology, genetics, chemistry, all of that stuff. I love the sciences, so I've been very, very interested in this Ebola situation. I mean, is it a threat to America right now? No, I don't think so. Um, I think we're dealing with a different a totally different environment in America than they're dealing with in West Africa because like Brother Terry said, as far as what I know and what I've been able to read and, and, and study and, you know, figure and formulate for my own, Ebola is not a very contagious disease. Like it's not very viral and it's 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 astonishing to even think that they've had such difficulty containing it in Africa, and in that, I'm not saying that the virus is maybe more contagious than we believe it is. I'm saying that I don't think they're doing a very good job um, to try to contain it in Africa. Um, when you look at the fact that you have to come in contact with the bodily fluids of somebody in the late stages of infection, not meaning I got infected two days ago and, you know, you touch my tear or something. No, I mean, I have to be showing symptoms of having been infected for my blood to have enough in it to infect you. It's extremely difficult to catch. And I think what you have going on in Africa is a lack of health infrastructure. You have people who are at home, um, who are at home being cared for by relatives who are getting sick and getting into the late stages of being sick and still being cared for by relatives. And those relatives are naturally coming into contact with the bodily fluids and they're contracting it. And then the cycle continues and from there it can be contracted from dead bodies. So you have to, as long as it's still obviously alive in the body, but as soon as a person dies, the, you know, you can still contract the disease. The virus is still there. So, you know, it's, it's, it's not a very contagious disease. So we're wondering why in the world is it even still spreading in Africa? The question, the, the question for me has to go directly to um, what, are they, what is the World Health Organization really doing? And even then when you talk about now with all of the symptoms, it looks like, a, it looks like there are a lot of people making money off of it. Um, you talk about Tecmura, a pharmaceutical corporation who had a 45% increase in stocks, uh, stock price the very same day that they announced that they were going to go into the market to produce a cure. You had a bunch of other organizations coming into play. But I think this Ebola situation is bigger than just Ebola when you start looking at um, the PrEP Act which pretty much gives pharmaceutical companies, once a, a health emergency has been declared, a free license to create drugs and experiment without fear 
of um, of any type of liability or financial recourse for if they do anything that causes harm. Um, you know, you have to look at just a lack of anybody to really talk about this Ebola and, and, and what really can help or what really can stop the disease. When you look at what's going on in Africa, there is a lack of attention from everything I can gather uh, that's focused on basic medical treatment. I mean, most of the people that die with Ebola die from dehydration. You know, why isn't, shouldn't it be a simple thing to have uh, blood there to give them blood if they need blood? Shouldn't it be a simple thing to have IV dropping fluid in them when they need fluid to kind of keep their hydration levels up? Why is nobody talking about the fact that the virus becomes inactive when exposed to sunlight? Why is nobody talking about the fact that vitamin C is extremely, or vitamin D and vitamin C are extremely effective at causing the virus to go inactive? Vitamin C actually causes a Fenton reaction, which is, for those that don't know, is basically a, a reaction in the cell where the cell becomes a free radical and it destroys itself. And that's caused by something as common as vitamin C. Why is nobody talking about all these basic solutions to this problem, but instead we got all these companies gearing up, loading up with, with, with uh, web, uh, 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 experimental drugs. They're in the lab creating all these new drugs. They're talking about all this advanced ZMAP and all this other stuff. They got us all hyped up on cocaine with all this other crap that they're talking about, but nobody's talking about the simple things that are proven to work when dealing with Ebola. Nobody's talking about any of the simple things. And that's one of the reasons I think that it's not a real threat here in America. Our basic medical infrastructure is in place. Um, we, we have the capabilities to quarantine people. We have the capabilities to give somebody an IV tap if they need an IV drip. We have the capabilities to give people blood if they need blood. We have a public that's already scared as hell of everything that comes out anyway. And in a lot of cases, the fear is annoying. But in the case of a, a pandemic or an epidemic, it's beneficial because people are more likely to go to the hospital. So it's just a matter of making sure that the hospitals, the people that are in there, are adequately staffed and adequately knowledgeable to be able to determine what's real and what's not and to take the accurate steps. So I don't think it's a threat here, um, but the whole Ebola situation, that whole universe in and of itself is extremely interesting, and I think everyone should definitely be paying a lot of attention to it. Um, we definitely shouldn't be getting hyped up on fear, though. I mean, every year for the last, what, five, six years, there's been a new scare. Um, I can remember when I worked for the uh, Florida Pharmacy, and the uh, H1N1 came around. And when I tell you that, and that was actually looking back on it now, by all reports, that was actually a mild flu season, you know, with H1N1 involved. And we had warehouses and stacks and warehouses and stacks filled with H1N1 vaccine that we couldn't use because, the, you know, we had ordered so much of it anticipating this major outbreak Companies made so much money, we couldn't use any of it. In some countries, it actually made people, it made people's flu symptoms worse. In Japan, it was linked to children committing uh, suicide. It was, just, it was a horrible situation. Taxpayers had to absorb the losses as we had to keep insurance on these things and wait for it to expire to be destroyed, and nothing ever came of it. And then we saw the same thing later, and then we saw the same thing later, and now you know, I'm questioning, are we going to see the same thing with Ebola? And I'm not so sure if somebody actually came from Liberia and came over here or whether a CBC somewhere actually has sloppy handling and something got out, which was the case when you talk about the avian flu pandemic or a couple of the other things that they've recently admitted, oh, that didn't actually occur naturally. We had it in the lab, and what had happened was uh, – blah, 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 and it broke, and it got out of our facilities, and uh, blah, blah, blah. So, you know, that's another possibility. But I don't think it's a threat right now. Could it become a threat? 
Of course it could. If we handle this thing sloppily and messily, it'll become a huge issue. But right now, I, I just don't see it as a huge issue. For me, a bigger issue is dealing with the ensuing panic that's going to happen as people find out and dealing with these companies that are going to definitely take advantage of the PrEP Act to make profits and harm people. And to piggyback on what you said, you are absolutely correct. Substandard medical care in some of those hardest hit countries on the continent the Sierra Leones, the Liberias, even parts of Nigeria, which is the richest country in uh, Africa. That substandard health care goes a long way toward helping that virus basically spread. Plus, cultural differences between how they handle their sick and how we handle our sick over here, too. That makes a lot of a uh, differences as well you know in their culture you lay hands on a dead body before you put it in the ground or I read an article about one sister that took care and and basically nursed back to health I think it was four people in her family that had Ebola and she nursed back to help all of them except I want to say the 12 year old he ended up passing but that might be because his immune system wasn't quite as strong and robust as you know a grown person but her mother father and I want to say aunt or something like that she nursed him back to health with none of the big space suits she tied <laughs> trash bags around her feet had on four or five layers of latex gloves and one little paper mask like you can buy at CVS anywhere in the United States and she nursed her people back to back to um to health because like you said it's it's not really a very easy thing to spread and basically there's no cure for it but the treatment is keep the people hydrated because people die of organ failure because of that dehydration in some cases depending on your um, immune system it liquefies your basically liquefies your organs right and you end up bleeding out your nose and bleeding out all the rest of your your orifices but you know that's the movie cases that's the that's the worst case scenario most right. people keep them hydrated like you said give them vitamin d give them vitamin c put them out in the sunlight and they they will recover because another thing that you don't hear a lot of people talk about is Ebola doesn't have this 100% fatality rate. Right now in Africa, with most of their health systems basically collapsing, it's still only killing between 45 and 55% of the people who actually catch it, which you know, is kind of amazing considering the situation that they are in over there. But you can look at it as one way of pharmaceutical companies selling more drugs. Because if they, you can best believe, if it broke out in Washington, D.C., where the white folks live, if it, if it broke out somewhere where, if Bill Gates and his family caught it, you can best believe they will find some kind of way of curing it. But pharmaceutical companies are not in the business of cures. They're in the business of treatment which a lot of people say is the reason why we haven't found a cure for cancer and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I think that it's something that we need to worry about is because all forms of health care, even in this developed country that we live in, is not created equal. And just like this person came to Dallas, went to, I don't, for those of you who are not from Dallas, uh, Presbyterian Hospital in Plano, is one of the premier hospitals in Dallas. This is not down where Kennedy got killed in the hood. This is not Parkland, you know. This is not where people go to die. This is where people actually get cured. And nobody asked that man where he had been. Nobody asked him, you know, have you been feeling this way? Nobody gave him treatment questions that led that might lead them to believe that he might have Ebola. And if that can happen in a hospital like Presbyterian, it can damn sure happen at a hospital in the hood. 
For those of you who from Gary, Indiana, if that happened in Methodist, half the city would have Ebola before anybody figured it out. You know, but that's my take on it. Um, who did we – did we get everybody on this? TV, did you say anything about this yet? Uh, yeah, you asked me first. <laughs> Did I talk that long, brother? <laughs> yes, you did. I, mean, I, mean, I'm, I know I'm missing somebody. You are Jane. Yeah. <laughs> did yeah, I miss but, but, you? I'm but, sorry. But, 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 I, but I do want to add something to it. Um, the thing about this virus, and, and it's, it's along the lines of what Patrick was saying, pharmaceutical companies are involved because they want to figure out how they can pad their pockets. And so what they're doing is they're using these African countries as their guinea pigs. So if you look at the countries that are mostly affected, it is these nations over in Africa that have very, very weak health systems. It's the countries that are lacking human and infrastructural resources. They're the ones who are dealing with this because these these long periods of conflict and instability. And the other thing we have to look at is that over in Africa, they are more community oriented than we are here in the United States. So you can have a small country over there, Guinea, Sierra Leone, Liberia, where brothers and sisters are congregating amongst each other in close quarters. You know, they, they touch each other. They hug each other. Of course, they're, they're, you know, they're making love to each other. They're going to these you know, little celebrations and community parties that they're having, and they're making contact with each other, which then, of course, is going to start to spread the virus. So I can clearly see where the virus can spread out of control over there with those elements being in play. So here in the United States, we do have the benefit of having resources that they don't have over there. But I always question when pharmaceutical companies get involved, because if they didn't make money, they wouldn't exist. So they've got to find some kind of way to prey on people when situations like this occur. And I do use the word prey on them because they're not donating money. They're soliciting ways to make money. And that means you're preying on the person. You're not really going over there looking to solve the problem. You know, you just say, how can we how can we test this and 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 get it on the market and get folks to buy it? So I would say for me and this and the, it's also reported that the guy did tell them when he got here that he was visiting from Liberia. So he made it clear. To them, yes, I'm, I'm here visiting from Liberia. And they actually asked him for his Social Security number and he didn't have one. So it's not like it's just it was a secret. Where did this man come from? And 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 why didn't anybody know? Well, he said himself, I'm, I'm here from Liberia. I'm visiting. I'm not feeling very well. And uh, in order for them to ask for his Social Security number, obviously, there had to have been some communication from their end as well. So it, it just dropped the ball a little bit, because if you look at the timeline, he left Liberia on the 19th. He gets in Dallas the next day. It's six days before he actually realizes that he's sick. Then two days after that, so the two days in between him getting sick and, and, and being admitted meant that they just gave him some antibodies to treat it, as you said, KP, and then he goes home even more ill. So they actually have to call the ambulance and take him back to the hospital. So, you know, this was known once it broke. It was known once it broke. So I'm not going to buy into, you know, quite buy into the conspiracy theory just yet here in the United States, but when it comes to pharmaceutical companies, I certainly don't trust their motives. Right. And yeah, we're here. I mean, we definitely, we, I never will, let's put it like that. <laughs> you know, and because and the funny thing about it is if, if you basically use this as a parallel with HIV on the continent, one of the reasons why HIV became such a virulent deadly disease on the continent is because do anybody really we got we got insurance we got medicaid we got medicare you know most of us do this put like that um we got ways of paying for our treatment we got ways of paying for the pharmaceuticals that are given to us to alleviate some of these afflictions that might you know come to us Anybody know what it costs for one uh, – what are they using now? It used to be AZT, but it's another name for it now. It's an antiviral drug. But anybody know what one of those pills costs? Just one. Not a treatment for a month. Just one. It depends on the um, brand and what it is. I know if you're using something like Cyclovir or something like that, That's one it. of those um, tri – you know, one of those tri-components – um, 
when we used to get those in when I worked at the uh, Central Pharmacy of Florida, those bottles used to be something to the magnitude twenty, thirty thousand dollars for one bottle. I mean, and and that was there was some that was as much as forty, fifty thousand dollars for one bottle with thirty pills in it. You know, so it the prices were just crazy just for that ridiculous. medication. Now, take that. You do the math. We gonna say a bottle of thirty for. We gonna go to the low end, twenty grand. Now. How does a person that makes a couple of hundred dollars a year, how does a person that's living on less than a dollar a day afford those medicines? And, of course, you say, well, you know, we give aid to those countries and, you know, who is there and um, uh, medicine signs frontiers, otherwise known as doctors without borders. They're there. They're giving treatment or what have you. It's... You know, that's not a sure thing. And if you don't have 20 grand to buy your 30-day supply of these drugs, then what do you do? You sell those drugs to governments. You see what I'm saying? And then governments then turn around and sell them to private contractors. Private contractors then cut them and they sell them to the populace in general or they sell them to other organizations that are actually providing them to the populace. But what happens when you run out of money? What happens to the group? What happens when the group that's giving you those drugs for free runs out of money to be able to provide you with those drugs? Then what happens to you? Then that particular affliction runs unchecked through your system. Next thing you know, you're in a box and you're in the ground. And guess who making money for it? The pharmaceutical companies. The investors in the pharmaceutical companies. That's what I hate about this situation with Ebola because I, I, I keep coming back to it, but we live in two different societies in this country. There is medical care for the affluent and the middle class, and there is medical care for poor people. And in some cases, notwithstanding the fact, like TB says, we're not as communal as our brothers and sisters are on the continent, we are a lot more communal than, say, middle-class people, you know. How many of us, you know, were taken care of by our grandparents because our parents had to work? How many of us come together for big family events like birthdays, holidays, etc., etc., etc.? And how many of us actually go and actually end up having to go to hospitals that are substandard? How many of us don't have insurance, so we have to go to the emergency room? And like you said, once the panic step in, it, it, it sets in, it's going to be hard to distinguish between those who have the common variety run-of-the-mill flu and those who actually have Ebola. What happens when you're sitting in the emergency room and the person next to you hawks up a Louie and the Louie got a little blood in it? What happens then? Now you've got panic ensues, all simply because... I don't have insurance. I have to go to the emergency room. I can't go to my doctor four or five days into, you know, not feeling well or what have you, and he give you a say and say, okay, man, I think you need to be isolated. I think you need to stay away from your family. I think we need to go and check everybody in your family and find out whether or not any of them are infected. We don't have that type of medical care in poor communities in, in the United States, white or black or Hispanic. It ain't got to be something that's directed just toward us. If it gets loose in the Hispanic community, it affects us. If it gets loose in the poor white communities, it affects us. Yeah, it's not going to basically be a big deal amongst those of us who have adequate medical care. It's not going to be a big deal. But for those who are poor, I can see it easily getting out of hand. And I can see it being exacerbated by the powers that be, because it's, it's a cash cow. Just like HIV took over from cancer drugs, used to be a time cancer drugs were the most expensive drugs that you can take in America. That was the cash cow for pharmaceutical companies for years and years and years. Then HIV came along. Now that's a cash cow. This could become the next cash cow because it's not killing enough people. So they don't, you know, they're not going to really step down on it because it's not killing enough people. 
And basically, it's only killing us for the most part. But be that as it may, um, you are Jane. Are you still with me? No. She okay. said she only wanted to listen after yeah. her piece. Now, she said, actually, she said she was going to leave earlier, um, that she wasn't going to be here for the whole show, but I was wondering whether or not she was still there. Um, lightning round. Next subject, we beat a bowl of the deaf. I need a minute from you, Mr. Patrick. Is Do you see the problems that the Secret Service is having with protecting our president. Do you see that as an inside job? Um, Just for that, give me two minutes because you thought too long. <laughs> I don't know if I have two minutes on that, but I, you know, I can <laughs> ramble. Um, <laughs> I don't, you know, when it comes to the president, President Obama and the way he is being treated by all parties involved, um, I just, you know, it, it's kind of frustrating. Even as an Obama critic as I am, you still have to recognize that they're just, they're just at some point it's just, it's just disrespectful. Like it's just, it's, it's almost like a personal insult. You know, like if you really want the man to, to, to be. Uh, and this is my message to white America. If you really want the man to fail and to be an idiot and to show that he's incompetent and this, that, and the third, why do you keep doing things to draw attention to yourself? Like standing up and calling the man a nigga or, or, or completely bypass or, or uh, stonewalling any of his, his acts or are failing to adequately protect the White House. Like, that's that's like the ultimate and foolishness. I haven't completely finished formulating my new word for foolishness when it crosses beyond foolishness, but I'm working on it. And as soon as I get it down, that's what I'm going to apply to this situation. I mean, you know, I, I'm hearing, and I read a brief, I read briefly about the uh, a, a, an intruder got to the second floor of the White House, really? They they got into the perimeter, onto the yard, onto the patio, into the house, up the stairs before you caught them. And this is supposed to be the most secure installation on the planet Earth, period. Like they empty clips on a, a, a black woman last year for driving by the White House. And you let somebody drive, you let somebody get into the White House, into the second floor? And then you're asking me if I think it's an inside job? I mean, you know, people are going to call me crazy anyway. I think 9-11 was an inside job. So, of course, I think this was an inside job. You know, like, it's just, it just it's, it's mind-boggling. It just blows my mind, you know, to think I have a dog that won't even let anybody walk by the sidewalk next to my house. And I have a pretty decent yard between my house and the sidewalk. And my dog's not trained for anything. He's just an aggravating old regular run-of-the-mill dog. You guys have trained security, electronic devices, dogs, sensors, this, that, radios, guns, Years of training, specialization, blah, 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 even the psychological advantage of saying we're the Secret Service. And somebody manages to slip by all of that undetected until they got to the to the second floor? Yeah, okay. <laughs> TB, give me two. Well, I, I'm in agreement. First of all, you have to look at the Secret Service and what they stand for, and it's supposed to be about one thing, and that is making sure that the commander-in-chief is safe and his family is safe, even at the expense of costing them their lives. And that's very important to know. They are supposed to be willing to sacrifice their very lives so that the president and his family can live. 
The majority of the Secret Service, including the head of the Secret Service, happen to be white people. They ain't giving up their life for no... Come on, man. <laughs> you serious? I mean, let, let's be real on it, okay? You had an instance in 2009 involving the Secret Service where, remember that little white couple just crashes the, the, the state dinner, just somehow walks on in, nobody really checks to see who they are. Why? Well, because they're well-dressed white people. So nobody says anything whatsoever. Then you got 2011. You got some clown with a semi-automatic rifle. He parks in front of the White House and fires off some rounds at the building. How does that happen? When, as Patrick just said, you had a black lady, she just cruising by, and you, and you put her on the ground. But a fool with a semi-automatic rifle gets to park in front of the White House and let off a couple rounds. Then you got 2008 where they embarrassed themselves by getting some <laughs> prostitutes and taking them from a strip club and going back to their hotel room to have them with just a good old time. You know, there, there's some clowns, man. There's some damn clowns. Then you got 2013, you got a Secret Service supervisor. He leaves a bullet in a woman's hotel room and then tries to force his way back into the room to get the bullet. It's like you're a Secret Service agent and this is what you're doing. This is the type of misconduct you're involved in. Okay. Then you have, again, 2014, you sit back drinking and, and then you're drinking some more. And then now, of course, we have this instance where the guy jumps the fence, goes into the White House and gets in the door before he gets tackled. And come to find out, there was a security alarm that was at the door, but staff thought it was too noisy, so they turned it off. All under this brother's watch. Now, this didn't happen when Reagan was president. This didn't happen when Kennedy, Nixon, nobody who was white. Did this ever, anybody tell me right now, did this ever happen this many times or ever when there was somebody white as the president? An answer, i got to say this, hell no. Wait, wait. It did not wait, happen. Yes, wait, there was that. No, not to this extent. Bro, no, wait, not, no, 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 there was that gap. No, there was something else, too. Thank you. <laughs> One, two, three, four, five. This is seven instances under a president's no, administration. No, a dude shot Reagan. A dude shot Reagan. Right, but house. where was that? That wasn't at? at the White House. <laughs> well, thank you very much. John Hinckley didn't, didn't bust off around at Reagan right in front of the White House. Hinckley didn't climb the fence and go into the White House and let off around. <laughs> you know what I mean? You know, and, and, and Secret Service wasn't drunk. And, and dealing with prostitutes at the time, I mean, the, the bottom line is, again, this, this has just been a complete insult to this man's presidency. And I don't care who doesn't like him. You see, this is, what I, this is what gets me about Americans. We claim to be Americans. We claim to be so down we're Americans. But even if you disagree with the president, you should respect the fact that that is the man in charge of making decisions for our country. All these Republicans that were president and even some Democrats, when they were president, I didn't, I didn't like their views. I didn't like their policy on anything. But I wasn't going to go against them because hey, that, that's the person that's in charge, and, and we, need to, we need to at least respect that and stand behind them. With this president, everybody's moving to the side and hoping that this man just fails. I said that again in another show. They wanted this man to fail from the moment he was president. They went on camera and made that statement. And you can see what the way the Secret Service is. All the, the woman was grilled by Congress, and, or the lady who's the head of it. And all she had to say was she read, read a statement, just a plastic fake statement. Yes, uh, I, I do acknowledge that we, we made some mistakes. And, 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 and yes, we, we've got to find a way to, to do better. You're just, again, you're the secret service. You're supposed to be the top police and protection force on the continent. And you're doing these clown things and these clown behaviors that expose this man and his wife and kids to death or whatever else. You can, now, if yet this doesn't deal with black and white, and if there isn't a little bit of you know, racist behavior in there, then I've just been living, I don't know, I've just been in a fog for 50-plus years. No. Okay, well... This is my take as we get ready to go out the door because it's right at our break time at 2 o'clock. Um, this is my take. For one thing, yes, yeah, she did. She read a stock statement that somebody typed out on an old typewriter and just put it in front of her face, what have you. And she failed to mention the fact that it was four days before they saw the bullet holes in the wall where somebody had been shooting at the White House, I guess, weeks before that. I think this is Obama's fault. I'm not even going to blame this on white folks. I think this is Obama's fault, and I'm going to tell you why. I think it's Obama's fault because 
of President Obama's fault because he's been too soft on white folks. <laughs> Every swinging dick in that office would have been fired. Because if that dude had on an explosive vest, he could have destroyed the whole White House. And you mean you turn who turn who turned that off? Who turned that alarm off? Your ass is fired. Matter of fact, I'm gonna make some call. I'm gonna get everybody in your family fired. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? I mean, heads is gonna roll. You wanna get some of the Republicans to talk about? They'd have been talking about for the next week how President President Jalal Tariq fired every white person in the White House. Everybody got to go. You see what I'm saying? Because my wife and my babies is in this house. And you telling me that you can't jump the fence, walk across the motion detectors, walk past our trained Doberman Pinchers, Rottweilers. What do you do? Throw, you know, like we used to do when we used to do uh, we used to do burglaries, throwing like hot dogs and bologna, <laughs> and they go run around the corner and eat. You know, what, what do you do? Walk in the door, and that's a lie. We come to find out that was a lie. He only got to the, to the door. As soon as he came in the door, we tackled him. Bullshit. He was upstairs. You see what I'm saying? And nobody had put an eye on him until somebody guess, looked in a camera and said, who is that bald head stud right there? Then they go search his car. A lot of people don't know about that. Or didn't talk about that. Go search his talk, his car and find 800 rounds of ammunition in his car. You see what I'm saying? That's how serious that was, really and truly. But, again, if he, meaning our president, was a little bit more stern with the people who he has appointed to run these different agencies. And another thing, don't get the wrong idea, the Secret Service... That's not their only job, protecting the president. They protect money. They are a division of the Department of Treasury. They got into the president protection game, I think, when Garfield got assassination, assassinated, or was it Lincoln that got assassinated? It I have to go back and do that. Lincoln. Right. It was after Th- Lincoln. That's how they got involved in it. You know, but they are there to protect the money. Yeah, you're right. They're supposed to lay down their lives for the president, but we kind of thinking that that's probably not going to happen if, if that situation ever arises. We pray that it don't, but if that, that situation ever arises, I kind of think it's not going to happen, right? But if, you, if I appoint you, Patrick, and I say, Patrick, your only job is to do this, that, this, and the other, and for some odd, strange reason, you have a brain fart and you embarrass me across the world, hey, look, Pat, you're my guy, man, but... uh. I'm going to make sure you get your pension, <laughs> you know, but you got to go, partner. You got to go. But he's the type of guy that if you look back at the people who he has basically let go, you've never really heard of him firing anyone. He accepts resignations, which we all know that's the government political way of saying you fired is I I have accepted the resignation of Terry Banks today. You know, I want to thank him for the the service he's done to his country. Now, bro, hey, look, uh, that lady that used to be up here that was in charge of the Obamacare website, I fired her today (laughs) because that was some bullshit because I gave her $300 million and she basically just threw it out the window. I fired her ass today. If he had to do that once or twice early in his in his uh, administration, he wouldn't be having half the problems that he's having now. But he's trying to be just a little bit too diplomatic. That's my take on it. That's why I say it's his fault. Start hitting some people in the head. Start kicking some heads out the White House door. And see how quick people straighten up. That's what white people do. And with that, I'm going to bring to a close another edition of Real Talk with Jalal Tariq. <laughs> and uh, I implore everybody and I beg everybody, go to urbanintellectuals.com slash members. Become a member of our group. Become a member of our movement because like we always say, the revolution won't be te- televised, but it must be funded. $24 a year. $24 a year. You throw that out the window every day. Become a part of something that is trying to move us forward. And with that, on behalf of my 
co-hosts, Patrick Irvine, Terry Banks, UI Jane. I say peace, and I'll see you guys tomorrow at 1 o'clock.